Excellencies, admirals, sirs, ma'ams, ladies, gentlemen, and officers of the Royal Marines. It's a great honor to, uh, to address such an august audience. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Admiral Griggs for inviting me, and I'd also like to thank, an thank Andrew Forbes for making me write the longest essay I've written since I graduated over 30 years ago. I was a child prodigy. The fact that most of you are serving officers means that I don't have to waste 10 minutes on HTEA, so let's crack on. Having to explain acronyms. IMO is the United Nations Specialized Agency responsible for safety, security, efficiency of international merchant shipping, and the prevention of marine pollution by ships. I've been asked to consider what is required for the successful implementation of maritime security measures, including the International Ship and Port Facilities Security Code in the Indian Ocean region. In doing so, I'll try to offer a civilian perspective on what is meant by maritime security. <clears throat> by outlining the development of the civil maritime security regime, the need for civil military cooperation between civilian authorities, coast guards, marine police forces, and navies, and the role of navies within this. Regrettably, I'm not going to have time to address a number of I important issues that you do need to be aware of, including UNCLOS, although it's already been covered, the 1988 and 2005 Suppression of Unlawful Acts Against the Safety of Maritime Navigation and their protocols on fixed platforms on the continental shelf, and other relevant legislation. However, these are addressed in my paper. Now, a wise military assistant to a very wise and respected admiral told me that if I haven't made my point within the first five minutes, then I've lost. As I have two minutes of my five left, here it is, and please write it down. www.imo.org and http colon slash slash g-i-s-i-s dot i-m-o dot o-r-g. And if you take away nothing else from my presentation, please note this. The IMO website will give you details of the IMO guidance on piracy and armed robbery against ships, and in particular, the guidance on arms on board, and also details of our initiatives in the Western Indian Ocean, the Djibouti Code of Conduct, in West and Central Africa, and much more. The GISIS Maritime, the GISIS Maritime Security Database will give you details of states, maritime security points of contact, ISPS code compliant ports, etc. And the Piracy Database gives you an up-to-date, fully searchable database that you can produce maps from of all incidents reported to the organization. Anyway, now to business. To you, the navies, the key pillars of a comprehensive maritime security strategy are probably the combination of maritime security operations, maritime situational awareness, and maritime capacity building. All good, dynamic, and active concepts. However, for the civilian maritime sector, Maritime security is more a state of existence than a dynamic process, and our approach is therefore somewhat different. Ah, isn't that beautiful? Perhaps for us, maritime security simply means the ability for merchant ships to pass upon the seas on their lawful occasions, serving global trade, and free from interference from terrorists, pirates, armed robbers, and those who would unnecessarily impede international maritime traffic, including bureaucrats and overzealous regulators, rather than an active mission to suppress wrongdoing. After all, that's what we in the shipping industry think that navies are for. Now, the events of the 11th of September 2001 and other terrorist spectaculars around that time changed the way merchant shipping was perceived. The general thought was, if they can do that with aircraft, what can they do with a shipload of chemicals or a gas carrier? 
And so essentially, the previous focus on protecting the ships or protecting merchant shipping shifted to the protection of states from merchant shipping, or at least the cargoes that they carried. Following 9-11, the diplomatic conference held at IMO in December 2002 adopted a number of amendments to the Safety of Life at Sea Convention, including the development of a new Chapter 11-2 on special measures to enhance maritime security, and the introduction of the International Ship and Port Facility Security Code, or ISPS Code, which went into force in 147 countries on the 1st of July 2004. These measures consolidated and added to the already existing IMO guidance on security, prevention of drug smuggling, stowaways, and port state control regimes. Essentially, these special measures to enhance maritime security were about reassuring port states that the ships entering their waters did not pose a threat and reassuring flag states that ships flying their flag would be protected while in other states, ports, and territorial waters. Now, as SOLAS addresses the safety of life at sea, it thus provides us with some jurisdictional challenges ashore, where in reality, most of the preventive security measures are applied. And because of this, IMO cooperated with the International Labor Organization, ILO, to, to develop a code of practice on security in ports, which effectively extended the ISPS code into the wider port area, and with the World Customs Organization on container security, which led to the development and adoption in June 2005 of a thing called the Safe Framework of Standards to Secure and Facilitate Global Trade. Very similar to what the aviators were doing in a regulated agent cargo system for air cargo, very similar to what the Americans had introduced as the Customs Trade Partnership Against Terrorism, systems-based control. But as with the wider safety-related provisions of SOLAS, the responsibility for implementation of maritime security measures on board ships lies primarily with the flag state. This includes ensuring that the ship security plans and standard operating procedures specific to the ship are developed and implemented, that suitably qualified ship security officers are appointed, that all crew members are trained to the required standard, and that plans and procedures are kept current and relevant through regular drills and exercises. It also covers determining the policy on the use of armed guards on board. Governments are also responsible for assessing the threat to ships flying their flag and determining the appropriate security level for that ship. An increase in security level should trigger the implementation of additional predetermined and approved measures in accordance with the ship security program. And a decrease in security level should lead to a reduction so that they are still proportionate to the threat. IMO itself has no policing or enforcement mandate. However, there are effective methods for, should we say, encouraging compliance. The maritime industry is a commercial enterprise. And in many ways, the compliance mechanisms play to that fact. Now, as stated, on the high seas, flag state law applies. However, as we heard earlier, when ships enter waters under the jurisdiction of a coastal or port state, those ships become subject to the laws of the state concerned. And essentially, states are entitled to inspect foreign ships visiting their own ports to ensure that internationally agreed standards are met and that any deficiencies are rectified before the ship is allowed to proceed. For maritime safety and environmental protection matters, this is referred to as port state control. Such controls are generally conducted by civilian maritime safety agencies and are generally technical in nature. Now, IMO recognized the need for a similar approach to be taken for maritime security. However, recognizing that national agencies responsible for security were more likely to come from military, paramilitary intelligence, or law enforcement agencies rather than civilian agencies, the term control and compliance was adopted 
for what is essentially security-related port state control. The legal basis for this is as defined in SOLAS Chapter 11.2, Regulation 9 on control and compliance. Don't worry, I'm not going to quote regs at you. And IMO has developed guidance on how to implement such measures. Now, a number of mechanisms for international cooperation have evolved to enhance the effectiveness of port state control. And just as with protection of shipping, as no one state can inspect all ships, groups of states have agreed to share information on ships inspected and deficiencies identified with a view to providing more effective coverage over a wider geographical area. So ships identified as being compliant in one port need not be re-inspected in other ports. However, those found to be deficient are likely to be inspected in other ports. Now, traditionally, these agreements have been formalized through the signature of a Memorandum of Understanding, or MOU. And in this region, the Indian Ocean MOU came into effect on the 1st of April 1999 as an agreement between Australia, Eritrea, India, Sudan, South Africa, and Tanzania. The MOU has continued to grow and evolve and currently 17 countries have become parties to it. And it's an effective system for regional cooperation that I would suggest could be readily adapted as a vehicle to enhance regional maritime security. The economic driver to compliance is generally compelling, as witnessed by the reduction in the number of accidents, oil spills, or other incidents at sea, to which Lou Russell referred in his presentation over the last few years. Years which at the same time have seen a massive increase in the size of the maritime sector. Ship owners operate ships to make money. That's what the merchant navy exists for, to make money. Simple as that. Ship owners will choose a state of registry for their ships and will generally do so in a way that maintains their competitive advantage. A flag state's revenue depends on the number of ships registered. However, a flag that develops a reputation for not enforcing adequate standards will see ships flying its flag being subject to increased scrutiny by port state control authorities with subsequent delays on ship movements. Ship mo ships not moving don't make money. So owners of compliant ships may elect to reflag, thus reducing the revenue to non-diligent flag administrations forces of economics. And again, this logic can also be applied to maritime security control and compliance measures. Now, in terms of implementation of SOLAS Chapter 11 to in the ISPS code, I think it would be fair to say that the main area of weakness is port facilities. Unlike on ships where an existing safety culture was relatively easy to evolve into a security culture, the security structure in ports is generally far more complex, involving many players from different governmental, law enforcement, and private entities. Many countries view ports as critical infrastructure and their security as a facet of national security. However, without clear national and local legislation, policies, and direction coordinating the activities of all key stakeholders, Security responses in port facilities are at best fragmented. Critical to the success of port facility security regimes, be they for protecting port infrastructure against terrorist attack, countering theft or other criminal activity, or preventing access to ships by terrorist drug smugglers or stowaways, is a well-coordinated, risk-based preventive strategy. Now, I've already said IMO has no mandate to assess compliance uh, of port facilities with, with Chapter 11.2 in the ISPS code per se, but it is readily apparent from our visits to countries that the absence of port and port facility security committees is an indicator of poor port facility security. And the active promotion of such coordination measures consistent with the ILO IMO code of practice and other guidance issued by IMO forms the cornerstone of the organization's work on promoting better compliance with SOLAS Chapter 11.2 and the ISPS Code. Protection of ships at sea is largely addressed either in the context of countering piracy 
or through the reassuring presence of naval forces in conflict zones or areas of high political tension, particularly in the vicinity of major choke points, through which significant proportions of the world's trade and energy needs are carried by merchant ships. The naval efforts to suppress piracy in the Western Indian Ocean have been deeply appreciated by the merchant shipping community. And whereas it's a truism that piracy is a symptom of wider land-based problems and will never be solved at sea, the potential for naval forces and coast guards acting in a law enforcement capacity can and has had a significant effect. This has been proved in Asia Pacific, most notably in the Straits of Malacca and Singapore by tripartite cooperation between Indonesia, Malaysia and Singapore, and also the RECAP initiative. It's being demonstrated again in respect of Somali-based piracy and is also showing some positive early results in the Gulf of Guinea. But it's important not to get sidetracked into the debate on whose responsibility it is to protect merchant shipping from pirates and the whole arms on board debate. The important issue is the protection of global maritime traffic upon which the world economy depends. National interests are far wider than the flag the ship happens to be flying, and in a global economy, as well as in the Articles of UNCLOS, all states have an obligation to suppress piracy. However, there does seem to be an almost existential crisis about what a navy's for. Politically, there doesn't seem to be much evidence of grand strategic thought and planning. Certainly, many states are hampered by government by accountant, a lack of joined up thinking, and dealing with the here and now rather than longer term solutions. At a time of increasing instability, the need for navies to maintain the deterrent capability of their high end warfighting skills remains critical. However, in these times of pressure on budgets and resulting inter service rivalries, there can be a natural tendency to focus on the Navy as an independent service and the survival of the naval role in its current form as an end in itself. It's worth remembering that whereas, an army is, whereas the Army is basically a kinetic weapon system, occasionally to be fired at coastlines by the Navy, navies are so much more than that. They're essentially diplomatic tools of government with the capability to project power and influence globally. Their ability to deliver kinetic effect, although essential, is secondary to that purpose. So the question really should be, what does the whole of government want to do in the maritime context? And in the wider security context, how can the Navy support that? Now, given that the focus is on countering the threat posed by rogue states and transnational op actors operating from ungoverned spaces, perhaps the sustainable solution will be to assist less, well, less developed states to overcome their sea blindness and to focus on developing national maritime business plans, supported by national maritime security strategies and maritime law enforcement capability in its widest sense. Indeed, this is what IMO is aiming to achieve in our current initiatives in West and Central Africa. The focus should be on developing national capacity to perform what are sometimes referred to as Coast Guard functions, or what the French Marine Nationale refers to as l'action de la terre en mer. That is, those tasks mandated by the various international conventions to which states have committed themselves, and then to establish an integrated network so that they can be applied regionally. These Coast Guard functions include the development of state search and rescue capabilities, prevention of pollution, protection of the marine environment, maritime and energy supply security, encountering piracy and armed robbery against ships, illegal migration, trafficking of drugs, weapons, people, and anything else you can think of, particularly i.e. fishing. Such a system could also play a major role in states' efforts to unlock the potential of their exclusive economic zones and to develop and maintain viable fishing industries, thus, completing to, sorry, thus contributing to sustainable development of fisheries. It's therefore important to take a strategic, long-term, and whole-of-government view to interpret the enhancement of maritime security as a building block for greater stability on land, making the fullest possible use of navies as a diplomatic asset within that comprehensive stability strategy. 
Now, not only are our navies good at capacity building when they're allowed to be, they're also very effective at opening doors and ensuring high-level engagement politically. Visits by warships and senior naval officers are a good vehicle for raising the profile of maritime issues to the highest levels of government. These can then be followed up by continued contact through the use of defense attaché networks, especially when forward-leaning states employ naval officers and marines in those roles. Ship visits taking national law enforcement detachments to sea can also provide useful demonstrations of the potential benefits of national maritime law enforcement capabilities and top-down as well as bottom-up training. However, sustainable programs using small embedded teams of land-based naval and marine personnel to deliver initial training and to train and mentor national trainers on a continuous basis are an effective way of developing national maritime capabilities as well as being significantly cheaper than visits by warships. This should not be looked upon simply as aid, rather it should be considered as conflict prevention and invested in accordingly. Now in summary, the key pillars of a comprehensive maritime strategy, to our view, are the combination of a full and effective impl implementation of SOLAS Chapter 11.2 in the ISPS Code, using navies to develop states' capacity to conduct their own maritime security operations, further developing national and regional maritime situational awareness, challenging sea blindness, and maritime capacity building with a focus on constabulary operations. And in this context, navies can be a force for good and naval staffs could influence their respective governments to take timely and positive action to enhance maritime security in its widest sense.